Welcome to our Lively U Virtual Learning Academy. Today's program is on tax-free investments and we welcome Chad Plotz from Edward Jones today. All right, well Danielle, thank you very much once again for uh, allowing us to uh, present here again today. Um, once again, my name is Chad Plotz with Edward Jones here in Bowling Green. We're located at 519 West Wooster, so not far from downtown. Um, so. Once again, uh, you know, we have this uh, program set up to bring uh, financial education uh, talking points uh, to the community here. So um, ultimately, what we're looking for is, um, you know, going forward um, on, on a monthly basis, um, really ideas. Um, so if there's a specific topic that's of interest to anyone, um, we'd love to hear more from you about uh, what you would like to, uh, to hear about. Um, obviously, we'll continue to bring topics that are uh, relevant, but uh, if there's something that's of interest, feel free to reach out to myself or Danielle, and we can maybe put that uh, in the rotation. So that way, uh, you know, we're providing uh, what, what's most important to you guys. So, um, so once again, appreciate you taking the time here to join us today today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, my screen here. One moment with me. Uh, trying to figure out the technology portion of this. So there we go. So um, so today's topic of conversation is that tax-free investing. Um, so so jumping right into it here, and obviously um, with this being a little bit different, uh, folks not here in person, but uh, you know at the end here we will open up uh, you know some conversation whether or not anybody has questions. So um, we'll kind of make our way through here. Um, so I guess uh, you know starting off here, our seminar is you know today is designed specifically to help you become a more educated investor and to assist you on your path toward reaching your unique goals. Um, so obviously each goal can be unique, but we believe the process to achieve those goals is going to be similar. Um, so what you're seeing here at this moment is just our step, five-step process for what we believe is what you want to look for when trying to achieve your goals. And that first thing is to, you know, in terms of any roadmap, right, is to first off determine where you are today. Um, so once you evaluate where you are today, only then can you begin to steer towards a clear and measurable goal, um, something that you're looking to achieve. So um, so that's, that's step two. And then ultimately, you know, finding a trusted financial advisor that can help you with tools and strategies to make sure that you're going to actually be able to get there, you know, reach your goals, which is that step three. Um, you know, if changes need to be made and modifications to your strategy need to be implemented, that's step four, right? Well, how, well if we're not on track, how do we, you know, how do we reach our final destination? How can we, how can we achieve these goals? And then ultimately step five is making sure that you're staying, um, obviously on track by meeting with somebody on a regular basis because life happens, uh, changes happen. Um, so you want to make sure that uh, your, your strategy is changing as your needs and uh, life changes as well. So um, jumping right in here in terms of, as we had mentioned uh, prior, right, tax-free investing, and it's, it's not what you make, right? It's, it's what you keep um, in terms of your investments. So uh, today we're going to look at several ways to benefit from investing while reducing the amount of taxes that you can pay. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen here now is some of those different areas. So individual bonds, unit investment trusts, or UITs, uh, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, or ETFs, uh, traditional and Roth IRAs, and then there's 401ks and 403bs, tax-free money market funds, um, and then life insurance. So as we walk through each of these options, uh, keep in mind that I can answer you know, questions at the end of the presentation, but if there's something specific to your situation that you would like to discuss one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, I will uh, have my information available towards the end so you can reach out or we can uh, get in touch separately. So, um, But before we discuss your options, uh, let's discuss, obviously discuss the reason what, that we're all here today, and that's to learn ways to reduce the amount of taxes you pay. Um, so let's just start off with some general tax terms that you'll want to be familiar with. So, um, so that way you'll have a better understanding as we use them in reference to certain investments throughout this presentation. Um, but the first slide here you're seeing uh, is 
if an investment is tax exempt, right? What does tax exempt mean? It means you don't have to pay federal taxes on it. Um, and in even some cases, it does include state taxes as well. Um, so the term is often interchangeable with you know, tax free, tax exempt. Um, so much in a way the same thing. So most, uh, most muni bonds or what they call municipal bonds are eligible for tax exempt status. So because they are sold to benefit you know, large community-based projects such as um, airports or schools or hospitals, even public transportation, um, keep in mind, though, that if you hear the term taxable, or I'm sorry, municipal bond, there, there is potential that they're not going to be tax-free. Uh, there are taxable municipal bonds out there. Uh, but for the purpose of this presentation, we'll be just discussing tax-free municipal bonds. Um, just wanted to make that clarification. So the tax benefits of muni bonds or municipal bonds, you'll hear me saying muni, uh, <laughs> short for municipal bonds uh, throughout, um, include tax-free interest that's generated from, uh, from your bonds and the possibility that you could just pay lower taxes based on having a muni bond. Um, so you may be wondering, okay, well, you know, why, right? Uh, you know, state and local governments are usually able to borrow money at lower rates than those available to the public, which saves taxpayers money. So municipal bonds aren't, you know, they're not always appropriate for everyone. There is an important trade-off that you definitely want to consider. And because these bonds pay tax-free interest, the rates that they offer are usually lower than the rates on taxable bonds of similar quality and maturity. So it's important to look at the rates available and at your own tax situation, of course, to determine a, you know, how many, if any, of your investment dollars should be invested in muni or municipal bonds. So this form here uh, may look familiar to you. If, if not, what this form is here is the IRS Form 1040. Uh, which is where you report your federal income taxes. So as you can see here, line 8A is for taxable interest income. So line 8B is where you enter your tax exempt interest income or interest that is you know, tax free. Um, so you know, this is important obviously because you know, the more income that you can move from line 8A to line 8B, that just means that's more of your hard-earned money that's going to be staying in your pocket. So um, once again, that might be a form that you're familiar with. If not, you know, your tax professional is uh, definitely well aware of this form. So um, so you can do, you know, move those assets, you can move those, um, you know, from eight line 8A to 8B um, in a number of ways. And you can do that by purchasing certain types of investments. Um, so some of those include muni bonds, which we've, you know, said multiple times now, in tax advantage mutual funds uh, or ETFs and unit trusts. Um, another way, a retirement account such as an individual account, um, or individual retirement account, which is an IRA, um, or a 401k or a 403b through your employer. So all of these help reduce the amount of taxable income you can earn. Um, so I'm not sure how many people have heard the, the phrase tax freedom day. Um, so Tax Freedom Day um, is the day, according to the Tax Foundation, on which most Americans' year-to-date earnings are enough to cover their federal income tax bills. So in recent years, Tax Freedom Day has usually occurred you know, mid to late April. In other words, most Americans spend more than four months of the year from January through Tax Freedom Day working just to pay taxes. So why all this? Why all this fuss about taxable versus tax-free? Well, uh, does it really make that much of a difference? Uh, obviously, you can be the judge of that going forward here. Um, so, the tax-free versus uh, taxable comparison. Well, so this is a good illustration that you're seeing on the screen now of how you can keep more money or more of your own money by investing in comparable tax-free versus taxable investments. Um, so. <clears throat> I guess, for example, uh, you know, look at how, uh, look at how much an investor earns on a hundred thousand dollars of taxable investment, right? If they yield or return 5% in one year after taxes, well, in this scenario, right, if she is in the 24% tax bracket, well, 5% on the hundred thousand, well, she's going to pay $1,200 in taxes based on a 24% tax bracket, which keeps about $3,800 of 
her yield of her return in her pocket. Well, an investor that's in the 37% tax bracket, as you can see there, well, they're going to pay 1850 in taxes, and they're only going to be keeping the 3150 So in comparison, if that same investor was to choose instead to invest that same $100,000 in a tax-free investment, which was only yielding 4% instead of 5 such as a muni bond, well, she would pay $0 in federal taxes, keeping the full $4,000. So even though the rate is lower, she actually keeps more because she doesn't pay federal taxes on the investment. So this, is the, this concept is actually called tax equivalent yield, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment here. So, But the next thing I want to show you here, and uh, you know, I'm not sure how many folks uh, know exactly what tax bracket they are in. Um, if you do know the tax bracket that you're in, you can actually find that tax bracket on this table. And this is actually going to show you the rate your taxable bonds would need to match that of a lower tax-free bond. Again, uh, this is known as a tax equivalent yield. So municipal bond interest is also exempt from the 3.8% affordable care investment tax. Um, so therefore, this tax is included, you know, that tax is included when we're talking about the marginal tax rate when calculating taxable equivalent yields. So uh, once again, this is just giving you the comparison of, okay, well, if I'm investing in a taxable bond, which my returns are taxable, versus the yield on a tax-free bond. Um, so it's just showing you those comparables. So keep in mind that most municipal bonds are exempt from federal income taxes. Um, now, if the bond issuer, the person issuing the bond that you're purchasing, is from your state, the interest may also be exempt from state taxes as well. Um, so additional benefit there. I think I missed that. So uh, you, you can see, uh, sorry, that, that taxable uh, versus the tax-free um, slide there, uh, depending on your tax bracket. So once again, these slides are something that I can uh, provide each individual if, if, if you want to uh, be able to reference these in the future. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on that. So now that we know the tax benefits of buying tax-free muni bonds, uh, we can talk more about the ways that you can actually own own them. So, um, you know, in those scenarios, there's individual bonds, unit investment trusts, which are UITs, we'll refer to, um, mutual funds, and even ETFs, so which are exchange traded funds. So, as I mentioned earlier, the interest earned on a muni bond is federally tax exempt because they are issued once again by um, states and cities and counties uh, to raise, you know, money for public projects. So. <laughs> They do offer other benefits that make them attractive investments. So first, they provide semi-annual payments at a fixed interest rate. Um, second, they offer fixed maturity date, right? And a variety of maturities are available. Um, so if you are looking for something as a more long-term investment, you can look for a, a, you know, a maturity date that matches that, that, uh, that ultimate goal. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Third, well, individual bonds typically offer higher rates than unit investment trusts. Um, so generally, individual bonds are issued at their par or face value, So, which we, in terms of value, is about is $1,000, right? So which is also the amount returned to the bondholder at maturity. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you do purchase a $1,000 bond, once again, at the end, um, which they call a maturity date, uh, when the investment matures, you would receive that $1,000 back as long as the bond doesn't default. Now, the initial investment minimum to purchase a bond is normally $5,000, and individual bonds can then be purchased <coughs> excuse me, in uh, $5,000 increments thereafter. So bondholders will receive par back as, once again, once the bond matures or is called. Um, and... Uh, jump into the next slide here. All right, so many different types of bonds are available. Um, so this slide is discussing the investment grades and default rates, right? So we recommend purchasing quality bonds assigned by independent rating companies such as Moody's or Standard & Poor's or Fitch. So you may have heard of these. You know, we would, we would uh, talk about in quality uh, bonds in regards to uh, ratings of, you know, 
triple B or higher uh, with the S and P and Fitch. So, so why, right? Uh, you know, why is it important to consider quality, right? Because history has shown that the lower the bond quality, well, the higher the chance of default. So this slide does show that, um, you know, what happens when a bond is in default. So a bond is considered to be in default when it fails to make timely interest or principal payments. So this chart is actually going to show default rates of muni bonds from 1986 to 2018. Uh, this line in the middle actually separates what are considered to be quality bonds from those that are that that are going to carry more risk. Um, you know, these bonds may you know boast higher yields, right? But along with that comes higher risk of default, and sometimes significantly higher. You know, even 40%. Um, as a reminder, bonds that offer higher rates tend to carry higher risk. So in addition to the possibility of default, there are also a few other risks to keep in mind. Uh, bonds may be sold on any business day at the current market price, um, and that current market price could be more, less, or even the same as your original investment. Um, bonds are subject to interest rate risk. So in other words, when interest rates rise, prices of bonds can decrease. So um, you know, if you purchase a bond at a 2% bond, right, that's paying a 2% yield. Um, well, if interest rates start to go up and now somebody can go out and buy a 3% bond, right, that's paying a 3% yield, well, the value of your bond that's yielding 2% is no longer gonna be as valuable as it once was when you could buy them for 2%. So this means that you could lose principal value if it is sold prior to maturity. The idea is to keep it through maturity, but if you needed to sell it, there's potential that you would not receive your original principal back um, in full. Um, so, but the idea is, is that if you hold it through maturity or the call date, it will you know, pay back their par value uh, if held. So, um, remember too that the bond interest payments do not increase or decrease with inflation. So as prices of goods and services rise, bond payments and principal remain constant. So in other words, your dollar buys less, which is referred to as the risk of purchasing power, right? Uh, much like stocks and other investments, diversification is important to consider. Um, so individual bonds that don't offer diversification that unit trusts and mutual funds do. Um, so you want to keep that in mind. You choose, if you do choose to invest individual bonds, you know, we would typically recommend that you buy a minimum of 10 bonds and vary each bond by industry sector and maturity length and um, even geography, right? Um, so last in case of muni, muni bonds, many are often callable. So this is an important detail. Uh, this means that the issuer reserves the right to redeem your bond on a set date prior to the maturity date. So if you purchased a 30 year bond in the hopes that it was going to be providing that guarantee, well, that that yield year in and year out for the next 30 years, well, you would want to make sure that when you purchase it, that you're aware of what the call date is, because um, many bonds have the ability, once again, uh, that the issuer can redeem the bond. They pay you back your principal that you paid into it, and they are basically buying back the bond. Um, so if this does happen, obviously the life of the bond can be shortened pretty significantly as much as you know, 10 or even 25 years, right? Uh, this will affect your income stream, which is important to keep in mind. So, um, you know, to keep a stream of income consistent from your investments, you may need to reinvest, you know, that money if, if a bond is called. So depending on the time of the call, you may have to reinvest into a principal in, or your principal into another fixed income rate, which, you know, may be when rates are lower than what they were. So um, this is known as reinvestment risk. And why is that important? Um, you know, that's a very important thing to keep in mind when discussing call features on a bond. Um, so, you know, that kind of wraps up the individual bonds, right? Um, there's a lot of details in there, and we can obviously discuss that one-on-one -on -one or if questions come up at the end. The next, uh, the next investment here is a, a unit investment trust, or a UIT is what you're seeing here on the screen. So, unit investment trusts are specific portfolios of stocks or even bonds uh, purchased by investment firms. 
Uh, they are like mutual funds, which we'll discuss in just a few minutes here, but um, they do have some differences as well. When, when you invest in a UIT, you invest in a unit of a portfolio of usually 15 to 30 tax-free bonds. Um, this obviously creates diversification in your portfolio. So because UITs have a fixed interest rate, they pay generally consistent monthly income. But it's important to understand that monthly dollar amount may decline over time as the bonds in that portfolio mature um, or are called or just not replaced. So UITs hold bonds with a variety of maturities. So the portfolio within the UIT is professionally selected and monitored for quality assurance. However, it's not managed by anyone, um, much like mutual funds are. So the minimum investment in a UIT is typically less than an individual bond. It's normally $1,000 um, is the minimum investment. And it may be sold on any business day at the current market price, um, which may be, once again, more or less or even the same as your original investment. Um, so with UIT, investors receive some principal back as each bond inside the portfolio matures. Um, so once again, you're looking at a scenario where um, you know, your income stream can uh, be lower as time goes on. Um, so because there's diversification, though, you may be thinking, okay, well, maybe I can be getting higher yields and go with um, – maybe some less quality uh, bonds, right? Well, um, we would still say that, no, don't, you, know, you don't want it just because you have diversification doesn't necessarily mean that you should be looking at um, higher risk uh, bonds at that point or lower grade bonds. So we would recommend you choose UITs that hold quality um, investment grade bonds. Um, you know, once again, triple B or higher. So. So the benefits, right? So that next here is the risk. So in addition, in addition to some of the risks associated with individual bonds, once again, um, UITs carry some additional risks. So first of all, uh, UIT may be sold on any business day. So we had discussed this, um, the idea that, well, um, you know, if it's trading during the day, that you know you have the ability if you were to sell it, that it, you know it could return lesser value based on the day uh, than what your initial premium was. So um, second, UITs with bonds are subject to the same interest rate risk we discussed in individual bonds, right? Um, so that doesn't change either. But when it comes uh, to taxation, the income from bonds inside muni um, UITs is generally exempt or expected to be exempt from federal tax, but the activity inside the trust can cause uh, you to receive taxable distributions or uh, have your income reclassified on your tax documents. So when looking at UITs, it's definitely uh, recommended that you sit down with a, a professional to go through the specifics of them. Um, and the next slide here. Um, also remember that individual bond payments do not increase with inflation. So UITs with bonds are subject to the same purchasing power risk we discussed earlier as well. Um, now, last, it's important to understand that when bonds in the trust are called or mature or sold, uh, principal will be returned as it goes, right? Um, so it cannot be reinvested into a UIT. So interest income will be reduced by the amount that the bond was paying into the portfolio. So that's, once again, UITs, unit investment trusts. Uh, the next portion here is mutual fund, uh, mutual funds. So let's look at our third way here. Uh, with a mutual fund, you automatically own a diversified portfolio um, with you know, typically even a larger array of bonds. So it could be 30 to well over 100 bonds. So it's, once again, instant diversification. But keep in mind, though, the diversification does not guarantee any, you know, guarantee a profit or protect you against any type of loss. Uh, these bonds are selected and monitored much like, uh, well, they're selected like UITs and monitored, but they're not actively managed, uh, or they are actively managed, unlike a UIT. A UITs are not actively managed. Uh, so these managers track the fund's credit quality, liquidity, and ability to make interest payments. Uh, mutual funds do not have a fixed maturity date, though. Um, so you can own them for as long or as you know, short a period of time as you want that you know, helps uh, reach your goals. So the initial investment for mutual funds, that's another portion of this. Um, if you recall, the individual bonds are 5000 
UITs are 1,000. Well, the initial investment on mutual funds is uh, quite a bit lower, right? There's uh, you know, some investments that you, mutual funds that you can get into for as little as $250 to get started. So um, keeping in mind, you'll receive monthly payments, um, which you can reinvest uh, to benefit from compounding, right? Uh, you know, the power of compounding. Um, if investment objectives change, though, many bond funds allow investors to move shares into another fund um, within the same fund family, uh, which is a, another <laughs> detail that we could uh, speak more in depth about. Um, you know, and you don't you don't incur additional costs um, when you when you exchange within one fund family with mutual funds. So um, now let's look at. Whoop. Okay, so let's look at our final way to own a muni bond, um, and that's through ETFs. So ETFs are passive investments, and those are designed to just track the performance of an index, um, and that's by selecting securities to replicate that index. So as a result, uh, they can provide broad exposure to asset classes uh, for additional portfolio diversification. But keep in mind, though, that 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 diversification, once again, does not guarantee any type of profit or protect against loss. So um, like mutual funds, ETFs don't have that fixed maturity date um, that an individual bond would have. So you can own them as long as you want. Um, because ETFs are passive investments, they have lower expenses than mutual funds or UITs. But they're also, because they're passive, they're not going to outperform the index, right? They're, the idea is just to mirror an index, um, which mutual funds are there to, once again, be, once again because they're managed, um, are there to outperform an index. So, um, so once again, unlike mutual funds, though, they do trade on an exchange, so their you know their price changes throughout the day, much like a stock would, as opposed to a mutual fund that um, you know their their value is locked in at the close of the market each day. So, all right, so mutual fund risks, right? Um, let's go to. Yeah, so the, when we talk about the risks of mutual funds and ETFs, uh, you know. They're fairly similar, but you know, since a municipal bond fund is made up of a number of div individual and in, uh, municipal bonds, it is subject to some of the same additional risks as individual-owned muni bonds. Um, you know, the rate of return will fluctuate along with interest rates, so your income will be inconsistent. Um, you know, that's that's one of the things about muni bonds, or I'm sorry, mutual fund uh, munis. Uh, they may be sold on any business day at the current market price, which may be more than or less, once again, than your original investment. Uh, mutual funds don't have a fixed maturity, so there's no guarantee you'll receive your original principal investment back. Um, also, dividends from the investments in a mutual fund may be increased or decreased or even eliminated at any point without notice. So uh, definitely risks that you'll want to keep in mind. Um, likewise, bond uh, ETFs, possess the same risks we just mentioned with the, the uh, bond mutual funds. Um, in addition, high yield bond ETFs tend to be more difficult to sell as well if you were looking to, to get out of them. It's also important to understand that the returns of leveraged and inverse ETFs, which are terms you may hear if you're looking further into ETFs, uh, they can lead to unexpected performance results over long periods of time. So uh, we don't think they're really suitable for long-term investments. So other tax advantage options, right? Um, and these are ones that you may be more familiar with, traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs. Um, so let's start with the traditional IRA. When you contribute to a traditional IRA, it may be tax deductible. Uh, it's, the idea is it's gonna grow tax deferred. Um, so when you take a distribution on the assets from a traditional IRA, it will be taxed at that point based on your current tax bracket. So um, once again, if you take a distribution in retirement, what tax bracket are you in in retirement? So some people may realize a tax advantage because they may be in a lower tax bracket at that point in time during retirement. Um, so you know, that's something where you got to you know, really weigh out um, you know, your tax brackets, right? Would we rather pay taxes today at historically low tax brackets, <laughs> as we're speaking here anyway. Um, so what tax bracket are you in today, right? Uh, if you can take advantage and pay 12% tax today, if that's the tax bracket you're in, um, and allow 
if you want to pay the taxes today, right, that's going to allow you to invest into a Roth IRA, which is your second option here. So the Roth IRA taxes are paid today and it's going to grow tax free until you take a distribution. So it gives you the ability of tax free income in retirement or when you take those distributions. Um, so which plays into tax efficiency, right? Um, do we want to in a traditional IRA receive a tax benefit today to push the buck down the road uh, just to push your taxes further out until retirement. Uh, because in retirement, when you would take your money out of a traditional IRA, you're going to be paying, paying taxes on the money that you had invested because you never paid taxes on them, in addition to all of the growth that happened in the account over that period of time as well. Um, so once again, tax efficiency, both buckets are normally a very good strategy. Um, but it's each person's unique scenario that is ultimately going to determine what's appropriate. Um, so the next thing here that you're seeing is, um, let me pull up the employer sponsored plans here. All right. So employer sponsored plans. So that's when you're typically referring to a 401k or a 403b. Um, so those are much like your traditional IRAs. Um, so your salary deferrals are taken from your pay before your federal income tax are even deducted. So your contributions are considered pre-tax. So like a traditional IRA, like we just discussed, your balance grows tax deferred and taxes are paid when funds are distributed in retirement. Uh, you may be in a lower tax bracket when funds are distributed, and that's ultimately the goal. <laughs> so uh, if your employer makes it available, the other portion that you're seeing here is a Roth 401k or a Roth 403b, uh, which combines some of the most advantageous aspects of both the 401k and the 403b, along with a Roth IRA that can grow tax-free. Um, so once again, that's something whether or not the employer plan actually offers it, it's not available in all employer plans. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so in addition to longer term investments for things like your retirement, it's important to keep a portion of your money in an account for short term needs too. So you, you do wanna keep, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, the next portion here is um, life insurance. So now that we've discussed, obviously, the tax-free investments that you could be in, uh, we should also discuss life insurance, uh, which can help protect your portfolio and, and can also offer a tax advantage, right? So term and permanent life insurance policies uh, provide a death benefit to your beneficiaries that is free from federal income tax. So those benefits may, however, be subject to state or uh, state or even a state and local taxes. So you definitely want to reach out to a tax professional if this is a strategy that you want to implement to provide some tax-free income um, and tax-free death benefit to a beneficiary. Um, so in addition to the income um, tax-free death benefit, uh, permanent life insurance actually helps you build cash value tax deferred. Uh, so it's another tax deferred strategy. Uh, permanent life insurance policies may allow you to access cash value during your life um, on a tax advantage basis. So once again, a, an important feature to keep in mind. Um, so what you're seeing here are two slides that it, feel free to reach out to me or Danielle and we can get you some more of this information. Um, or if once again, we are recording, so you could always come back to this uh, video um, to get these next two slides. This, this is what you're seeing is a quick reference uh, feature for the features and benefits um, that kind of gives you a head-to-head -head comparison of each of the tax-free investments that we've discussed today. So the individual bonds and the UITs and mutual funds and ETFs. Um, so it just kind of gives you the you know, once again, pros and cons, features and benefits of each. The next thing here is the tax-free investment risk, right? So next, this is basically just a comparison chart, and um, you know, you'll notice a good deal of overlapping here again with the bonds and UITs and mutual funds and ETFs. Uh, you know, please reach out if, if this is a slide that you, you would want to reference in the future. I can definitely provide that information. So, so just as you know. Is a, a quick reminder here why you may want to um, consider some of these different investments. Obviously, we've covered a lot of ground here today in a short period of time, uh, but a few key points or takeaways uh, to remember. Um, 
you know, when it comes to individual bonds, uh, tax-free municipal bonds are designed to help preserve wealth and produce reliable income on which you can depend in retirement. Um, so they also, in, you know, reinforce the fact that when tax time rolls around, it's, you know, it's not what you make, it's, it's what you keep, right? Um, and then with tax-free investments, your interest isn't taxed by the federal government, so you can keep more of what you earned in your pocket, right? Next, UITs. So UITs, they provide that built-in diversification and you know, they're readily available. Um, UITs are also you know, professionally selected and monitored and you know, produce relatively consistent income for retirement. So uh, good reasons there for a UIT. Um, mutual funds, once again, mutual funds are also gonna provide that built-in diversification. They're readily available. Um, you know, just keep in mind the idea of um, you know, the fluctuation in value there, um, but the ability to reinvest, take advantage of the compounding interest. Um, so um, ETFs, ETFs track the performance of an index, right? Uh, so unlike the mutual funds that can outperform the index, mutual funds there to perform as the index performs does provide that diversification. It does uh, provide for some liquidity ability as well. So, um, then the other options, right? Why employer plans? Why traditional IRAs? Why Roths? Why should we be looking at these investments? Well, these investments make sense for many people primarily because of you know, the tax-free benefit of the Roth or the tax-deferred growth potential of the traditional um, or the 401k and 403b. Uh, traditional IRA contributions, once again, may be taxable or tax deductible, uh, which would reduce your taxable income each year. Um, but once again, we're pushing the tax burden down the road. So are we in a better tax bracket now, or are we going to be in a better tax bracket in retirement? Uh, contributions to Roth IRAs are taxed at the time of contribution. So what tax bracket are we in today if we're going to pay those taxes? But keeping in mind, the ultimate benefit is Roths will grow 100% tax-free. Um, so how much, of a, you know, how much of that bucket of money that we want to be 100% tax-free? Um, 401ks and 403bs, um, employer plans, right, allow you to make pre-tax contributions that are lower, um, that can lower your taxable income today, right? Uh, once again, tax deferring, pushing the taxes down the road. Um, if an employer plan does allow for that for that Roth option, um, always a, a great option there too. Um, life insurance, right? Life insurance, I mean, first and foremost, the main reason to purchase life insurance is to protect, you know, your loved ones. Um, so whether you choose choose term or permanent policy or a combination of both or whatever the case may be, life insurance can help replace income and pay off debts uh, for your family and offset potential state taxes. So um, it's definitely a unique strategy that uh, many don't think of when we talk about tax efficiencies, um, but something that's definitely a, a something to consider in a, a portfolio or a strategy. So, uh, so once again, you know, this is a lot of information we went over here today. Um, but that's, that's what I had to go over. Um, obviously I want to open this back up to any questions you may have. Um, so Danielle, at this point, I'll throw this back to you and I appreciate you guys taking the time today. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chad. I'm going to stop mm. the recording.